We are uh, continuing in the book of Colossians, which we'll be doing this summer, uh, and we are in message number two. We went through the first 14 verses last week. We'll look at another eight or nine today, uh, Colossians 1, 15 through 23. Uh, ever since Cain and Abel, uh, there have been several questions that every generation has asked and tried to figure out. The first question is, what is wrong with human nature? Why do we keep messing this up, either from the personal level, which you read about in the newspaper almost every week, or maybe you know folks in your family, why do we keep messing this thing up, screwing this thing up, or at the relational level uh, in the home? Why do we have such drama going on? What's wrong with us? Uh, or then, of course, much wider uh, spectrum. What's wrong with human nature? And the second question is, what can be done about it? What is it that, that can we, we can do to fix not just the problems created by fallen human nature, but is there something that can fix human nature? Those two questions have reverberated through every generation ever since Cain and Abel. Now, the government uh, is an institution established by God, and at different points of time, government has either thought itself uh, more highly able to fix the problem of human nature or has been more realistic about human nature, uh, that it has an ability to, to um, not control, but at least to um, inhibit the full effect of, of the damage of human nature on us. Uh, at the time of Jesus, Rome was the uh, ruling power of the world. The emperor was, uh, was strong everywhere. Uh, Roman might was, uh, was uh, a part of the, the empire. Uh, and... Uh, uh, the, the peace of Rome, the Pax Romana, was the, was the great, uh, that was the great uh, speech by the emperor, the campaign promise. You know, if you let us come and rule your country, uh, you will experience the peace of Rome. Uh, and the statue of the emperor was everywhere. And on coins, uh, you would find, the, like this, you would find the, the head of the emperor on here as a reminder to the people that, uh, that the government uh, has some power with which to bring peace and, and, and law and order. Uh, in our own country, uh, if you look on the back of a dollar bill, you'll see uh, our uh, motto. Um, in Latin, it says, Novus Ordo Seclorum. In Latin, that means the new world order. Uh, that was uh, originally stated, I think, by Virgil, the philosopher. Uh, but, but we adopted this nine years after the Boston Tea Party. And the hope that this statement says is that there's something that, that we have the ability to do uh, as a country uh, and, and as a subset, as a government, in order to try to inhibit the uh, awful damage of human nature upon man. Uh, in my lifetime, uh, I remember the first presidential election was 1960. Uh, John F. Kennedy was elected. Uh, and I remember, I have a vague recollection that the sort of the stirring in the air around his campaign was that we were bringing in the new Camelot, sort of this ideal world in which we can, can finally move forward. And in every presidential election since then, uh, that's essentially what the candidates try to do. They try to, to give a vision of what the, the new world order that can be brought in with, uh, with our administration. Uh, in the Old Testament, the, the way that the Old Testament looks at the problem of human nature is really two great themes. That there is a good God who created the world and creation good. And that same good God one day is going to bring judgment in a way that will punish all that is wrong and make right or reconcile all those who come to him. We'll, we'll fix what is wrong in our human nature for those who come to him. Who would, who would admit, I need something different that I cannot do for myself. Now, as Christians, we call that the new birth, being born again. And I wrote a poem about this uh, about a week or two ago. It's in your handout. Uh, and it's uh, just kind of a way of describing uh, what is this new creation that God is trying to do in human nature. Uh, what is, the title is, What Does It Mean to Be Born Again? Nicodemus, an Old Testament scholar, came to Jesus, confused, a midnight caller. What the heck does it mean to be born again? Wasn't one birth enough on this earthly plane? Compared to the old life a man once knew, the new life in Christ is like being made new. 
a new cleansing from all my sin, muck and mire, my heart washed inside of all that was prior, a new forgiveness for all that once brought me shame. I can hold up my head because of his name. New inclinations with higher desires to do his will and please the Lord how he inspires. A new identity defines who I am. Empty spaces not needing to fill and to cram. A new purpose more than feeling satisfied. Learning to live like Jesus with him as my guide. A new start after repeated failures. Finding real life and life-giving behaviors. A new power over old temptations. The wonders of growing sanctification. And a new relationship with God Almighty, Father, Son, Spirit, grace for the most unlikely. Uh, that's the New Testament version of what's tr of the problem to fix human nature. Now, in our current culture, if you go to the philosophers, the philosophers will tell you, we're in the, the, the realm of the postmodern. What does that mean? Uh, it means that for centuries, for millennia, that man had in view that the fix for the problem of human nature was coming. The, the Western world defined all the way back from the early Greek philosophers sort of the way that mankind can be fixed. And the, what postmodernism has said, that has failed. The Western civilization model of fixing human nature has failed. And our institutions upon which civilization was built have also failed. Uh, government has failed to bring about this. Uh, the, the school system has failed to bring about this. Religion has failed to bring about change. The family has failed to bring about change. And we are sort of left to manage ourselves in how to fix human nature. Uh, and the, and the, one of the effects of that you see uh, in the news uh, regularly is uh, one of the ways is the opiate crisis, and the, and the other is the prevalence of suicide. You take away the great meta-narratives of Western civilization or the, the Judeo-Christian scriptures, and you're left to yourself? Is there any question that why we would have an opiate crisis of trying to fix something inside of me or just to feel better or the sense of hopelessness about which I am uh, feeling or look at my life? Leader after leader, government after government has come in still trying to fix things. Uh, all different kinds of world leaders the most unlikeliest of world leader appeared on the scene 2,000 years ago with little fanfare. Born in poverty. Raised in obscurity. By the end of his, uh, of his life, he had 12 devoted followers. One bailed on him, turned on him. It looked like the most unlikely of movements. And yet, down through the last 2,000 years, through the last two millennia, Millions and millions of people have had the beginnings of a new creation in them, the changing of who they are, who we are as a people. It's a job that won't be finished until heaven. But that is the solution to the problem of what's wrong with human nature. Uh, when Jesus came, he it was not just a new world leader, but a new world leader creation that he was bringing the hope of to people. Uh, that's what Colossians, or the passage we're going to look at, uh, entails today. These two great things. The new world leader who's able to bring about a new world creation inside of his people. Uh, let's look at this. Colossians 1.15 said, he is the, Paul said, he is the image. Christ is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. The, the, the teachers that were coming to Colossae and are giving a, a false gospel or a lesser gospel we're claiming that Christ was really not God himself but sort of a, an intermediate God between God the Father and us and and Paul comes right out and says no 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 Christ is divine and he gives different aspects and we looked at this last week and we'll look at it in this passage today one of them is this interesting word he is the image of the invisible God it's a Greek word icon you pull out your phone, your smartphone, you'll look and you'll see a bunch of icons on your phone. This morning I was on my laptop. Every time I looked at my laptop, when the desktop comes up, I've got a bunch of icons there. Uh, icon has two meanings in the Greek language. The first is an exact likeness of. 
So, for example, in the <coughs> with currency, if you look at uh, uh, like a penny, you'll see an exact likeness of Lincoln, or an old uh, Roman coin, uh, an exact likeness likeness of the emperor. That's what he's saying about Jesus Christ. You want to know what God is like? The exact picture of him you can see in this person, Jesus Christ. All of the divine elements or nature that you want to look at that make up who God is, you'll find in Christ. The second way the icon or image is used is of something that was hidden is now seen, now made manifest. So, for example, on your iPhone, when you see these icons, uh, it's not that the icon is so special, but you double-click on that icon, and suddenly what that icon points to is now visible. The document you want to see, or the picture that you want to see, or the, the, the video that you want to see, you punch on the icon, and, and suddenly what was hidden in the phone or in the cloud somewhere pops up, on your screen. Uh, that's what he's saying about Jesus Christ, the image of the invisible God. Verse 16, for by him all things were created. Not a creature, not an individual God between humans and, and the world and God himself, but the agent of creation. Just like John says in chapter 1 of the prologue, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers, rulers or authorities, all things are created by him and for him. Another picture of deity. Now, as we think of, as I think about all these things, about how, what he's created, thrones or powers, rulers or authorities, I think about um, man's attempt to try to solve human nature. At the time that Paul wrote, Rome was the prevailing power. How did Rome do it, curtailing human nature, or fixing what's wrong with human nature? In some ways, it was able, in a legal aspect, or by force, it was able to, to create something of the Pax Romana. Uh, but it couldn't curb human nature on a local level or in relationships, the messes that we make. When I think of the most educated civilization uh, up into the beginning of the 20th century, uh, I think of Germany. We all know what happened there. Even the most educated people at the time. Or I think about the scientific uh, ex uh, progress that we have made in our country and, in, and mostly have led in our world. Uh, and I'm all for scientific progress and research. But does that, does that curtail the problem of human nature? It makes our life easier. It makes some diseases uh, not lethal anymore. But does it fix what happens under the roof of your house? Or in your private moments when you're trying to make good decisions? He is created, he is above all these things created. Uh, verse 17, he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. He's not a creature, he's preeminent. All these are little glimpses of what divinity looks like. Or another way of saying this is if you were in Rome and you saw the statue of the emperor, you would think, oh yeah, that, that reminds me of the emperor. You looked at a coin of the emperor and you'd say, oh yeah, that's the emperor. Well, in this case, this particular icon Paul is talking about, it's not a statue. It's not a picture. The statue came alive and lived among the people and came to life after they crucified him. Verse 18, and he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead so that in everything he might have the supremacy. Now, up until this time, what Paul's described in our in these first few verses here is sort of Christ as Lord of creation. Now he's transitioning into these next few verses as he's Lord of the new creation, of, of God's work inside of human beings who come to him in need of repentance and the new birth. He's the beginning and the firstborn from the dead, meaning those who come to Christ as, as new birth people uh, in a personal resurrection inside of who we are, death to our old life, alive to Christ and the new life in him. He was the beginning of that by the resurrection. That's what Paul means here. Easter was that great moment where the new creation, possible inside of every human being who comes to Christ, 
and manifested in the church of God's real people uh, begun, began. Uh, right after the, uh, Jesus rose from the dead, there was one occasion that's really interesting to me. It's a little bit curious. The disciples see Jesus and, uh, on the lake, and, or over by the lake, and they're not really sure what to do because he, he looks like Jesus, but there's something different about him. There is something different about him, but it looks like Jesus. And it says they were afraid to ask him who he was. And the picture there is something like this. The new creation, there's a little bit of a picture or a hint here of what the resurrection does. It's not a clear picture, but it's a hint of a new creation because of the hope we have because of the resurrection. Verse 19, God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in Christ, in him. And the word fullness has different meanings to it, but in this particular meaning here, fullness means uh, like if you go on a cruise ship, and we've been on some cruises and enjoy that, it's really helpful if the cruise ship has a full complement of staff. That's a good thing. Uh, and it appears like the ones we've been on where the, 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 the cruise ships have had a full complement of staff. All the people that should be there in order to make the cruise enjoyable for everybody uh, are there. That's the, the, the word here that's used, or the meaning here of fullness, meaning the full complement of God's character is found in Jesus Christ, all of his, uh, all of his qualities. Well, up until this time, we have these two great narratives that he started, the, new, the creation that Christ has been over and the new creation of which he is a part of creating. Uh, verse 20, we move into uh, this new creation more specifically. One of the things that's always interesting to me as I, as I listen to uh, people in our culture uh, who are uh, uh, skeptical about the Christian faith, one of the things that trips them up is this. Uh, they look at something that happens bad in our world and they say, see, I'm not so sure about this thing of God being Lord of, of creation. Uh, or the ruler of the world. Um, it seems like he's not doing a very good job, is the idea. Uh, and I'm sort of reminded of uh, a quote by uh, Woody Allen. I think it was Woody Allen that said, I'd like to believe in, a, in God, but it appears to me that he's a bit of an underachiever. There's something of that idea uh, that people sometimes get caught up on, on this. Uh, God is not the CEO of this world. His job is not to make this world heaven. Heaven is coming. And the process of reconciling a rebellious human nature to a place that wants to be with God and wants to love him and to love other people the way Christ loves us, that day is coming. But we are not in that world yet. This world is a hard world, and it is filled with evil and suffering. And yet those things are meant to cause us to stop in our tracks to, to, to ponder what am I doing with my life uh, what is most important in my life and, and ultimately to bring us to Christ this reconciliation of, uh, of the new creation is still something that modern man looks for uh, in the postmodern world I think there are three hopes that uh, people put their hope in uh, one is education that an educated human Nature can be better. And the second is the belief that there's some type of evolutionary process going on where human nature gets better and better with time. I know if you study history, you will find that a ludicrous, a monstrous statement, a statement of tremendous denial. But people want to believe that's true. Place a hope there. Uh, education, the evolutionary process that human nature is getting better and better with time. And third is in science. But as good as education is, as good as science is, and as naive as the evolutionary process of human nature getting better, all three of those things run into that brick wall of reality. They cannot change the fundamental nature of what's broken inside of me. I need something different than what those things. And this is what Paul says. Here's the solution, verse 20. Through him, the one he's talked about for these last few verses, 
to reconcile to himself all things, or the things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. Ever since the shockwave of Adam and Eve's sin and their rebellion and the misery that has affected human nature, uh, both myself and that I inflict on other people around me, the brokenness that's inside of me and the brokenness inside of you, the heartache that we experience or that we inflict on others can be changed, he says, we can be reconciled back to God through his blood shed on the cross. Now, when I think about this reconciliation of, of my human nature or your human nature, there are four things that strike me. Number one, this is God's work. This is what he is doing. He is working on day after day. We are not particularly uh, avid partners in this, nor do we like the process, but he is about this work every day. Secondly, what's needed to bring about reconciliation, Paul says, has already been done. That's the work on the cross. The location of that, that work is the cross. And number four is that there is nothing or nobody outside of the scope of this reconciliation. No matter how far you may have rebelled against God and gone away from the things of God, you are still under the possibility and have the invitation given to be reconciled, to reconcile back with God. Verse 21. Once you were alienated, we had run away from God like the prodigal, every one of us in our heart. I want life my way. I want to do things my way. I don't want anybody to tell me what to do. I will have life how I want. We are a people in rebellion against God. We've alienated ourselves. In spite of that, once you were alienated, alienated and were enemies in your minds because of evil behavior, verse 22, but now he has reconciled you. People like you and me, who once were rebels. By Christ's physical body through death to present you holy in his sight without blemish and free from accusation. Verse 23, if you continue in your faith, established and firm, rooted, is the idea, not moved from the hope held out in the gospel, that is the gospel that you heard and that was proclaimed to every creature under heaven of which I, Paul, have become a servant. He's saying that the resurrection is that, the death and resurrection of Christ is that which brings about reconciliation. And that reconciliation that is in process now for those of us who have come to faith in Christ is in process and will find its ultimate hope someday in heaven. And that work will finally be completely done. Until then, we are a work in process. But the resurrection of Christ gives us the hope of promise that the recreation that we long for will finally be done. And life as we yearn for and hope for and ache for will finally be true fully for God's people. Now in this, I'm, I'm stuck, in, stuck in verse 23 that for most of this passage uh, and verse 23, he's talking about Christ as the agent of reconciliation. This is his work. It certainly is. But you and I are the implementers of his work of reconciliation. Uh, and Paul hints at this in the last sentence of verse 23. This is the gospel that you heard and has been proclaimed, meaning from Paul and some of his mission team to them, to every creature under heaven of which I, Paul, have become a servant implying you and I also take up this role of proclaiming as servants of this message of reconciliation. He is the agent of reconciliation. You and I are the implementers of reconciliation. He is the agent. You are the implementer. He is the agent. You are the implementer. There's no need to redo the agent of what's happened. All that's needed now is implementers. Uh, this week I looked up on uh, one website about malaria. Uh, and there's an estimate that about one million people die of malaria every year. Now we have medicine for malaria. The problem is not a lack of medicine. 
problem is we have a hard time on the implementation side getting getting the the medicine for malaria to all the remote places where it affects us what we don't need is somebody in a in a biology lab to recreate a, a, another medicine for malaria what we need are more implementers the um, we don't need to repeat the achievement of the discovery of medicine for malaria but we do need to implement the achievement of malaria uh, I'd like to close with, with an example of this thing of uh, the achievement and the implement uh, let's go to uh, this piece of sheet music uh, this is uh, the first page of the 1812 overture uh, we had a chance to hear this you're gonna like this had a chance to hear this a few years ago uh, the Prince took Mindy and I to to uh, hear uh, hear this Peter Tchaikovsky was the composer of this uh, sheet music and if you just look at the first page you can see uh, <coughs> all some of the different instruments the flute the oboe the clarinet in B flat uh, the bassoon the horn in F the trumpet in B flat trumb trombone tuba mallet percussion uh, timpani, uh, violin one, violin two, viola, cello, bass. And you look at that, I look at that piece of, of uh, that sheet music there, and you can marvel at the brilliance of somebody, a composer like Tchaikovsky, that can, can hear a melody and can put notes to it. And then he can also hear uh, great harmonies, smaller harmonies he can hear counter melodies and on all these different sheets of, of sheet music you will see uh, ebbs and flows of pitch and ebbs and flows of, of uh, rhythm pacing uh, loudness and softness uh, but that sheet the wonder of the sheet music is really not seen in a museum the wonder of the sheet music comes alive not by the agent or the composer, but by those who implement, who pick up a French horn, or a clarinet in B flat, or a flute, or a mallet to hit chimes, and bring this to life to hear. Uh, this particular uh, piece of music was written in 1880. And it commemorated the, the uh, victory uh, of the Russian army against Napoleon Bonaparte, Bonaparte in 1812. Uh, when the French, uh, are we, are we going to be good on that in a few minutes? Pretty good? All right. In, uh, in 1812, when the French army uh, ran into the Russian uh, winter as well as the Russian army and had to go back. Uh, once word came to all the uh, St. Petersburg and Moscow, the major cities of Russia, the church bells rang out and cannons displayed the wonder the victory the celebration that we had defeated we had defeated the French uh, the, the 1812 overture is the full name of this is the year 1812 festival overture in E flat opus 49 I can see why we call it the 1812 overture the first time people picked up instruments was 1882 in Moscow. And they, they played this for the first time uh, in a tent uh, un, under the shadow of the cathedral that was being built, uh, the Cathedral of Christ our Savior, in 1882. When I hear the last few minutes of this overture, I always think of two things. I always think of those men on the front lines in the middle of a Russian winter who stood up to Napoleon Bonaparte and his grand army and the victory that was won. But I also hear another victory in that music. I hear a, vic a victory of reconciliation coming and a celebration that I am going to enjoy and God's people will enjoy someday in heaven where the church bells will ring out, metaphorically speaking, and the cannons will display the wonder of the victory that's finally been won over this long era of our life and dealing with our own sinful human nature. That day is coming. 
for God's people who come to him out of their rebellion and repentance and the longing for forgiveness, find reconciliation and the beginning of a new birth that begins to change that stubborn, old, proud, self-centered nature that inflicts so much misery upon ourselves and upon those people that have to live with us and relate to us and begins to bring about the change that will finally be done and that we will enjoy for all eternity. That is the reconciliation talked about in this passage of Colossians, verses 8, 15 to 23. And it's available to anyone and everyone who will come to him in repentance and humility and faith in what he did on the cross to make that possible. Let's pray together. Father, we who have tasted the beginnings of the new birth and have seen the beginnings of your work in our lives to change our old human nature, that proud, arrogant, self-centered, stubborn folly and foolishness and so often brings misery and heartache to ourselves and to those who relate to us. We have tasted of that, and we know that you continue to do that work that changes every day, but we long for the day when it will finally be done. And we will finally not have to worry about or, or, or be pestered by our own nature and by the old nature of our brothers and sisters who are now in Christ and with whom we will love in heaven. We thank you for that day that's coming. Maybe you're here this morning and this, this whole Christian thing has been sort of fuzzy to you. Maybe you think it's about being religious. It is not about being religious. God has done the most amazing thing in offering a rebellious people, proud and arrogant, who wouldn't give him the time of day, an opportunity to come back and to have the very thing that's wrong with us, the beginning of the fix begun. Through the wonder of his love, Jesus Christ, that he has given to you, poured out most clearly and seen on the cross. And the hope of that change guaranteed through the resurrection. All he asks is that you come to him in, in humble repentance and say, I am a sinner. I am a mess. I cannot change me. I come to the cross in repentance and say, Please come into my life and be the Lord of the new creation in me. Save me from my sin. We at Pacific Church of Irvine invite you to join us every Sunday at 9.30. You can also visit our website at pacificchurch.com.